All right, take it away, Brian. Um, yeah, so uh, if this is also, um, a, this is a chance for you to ask any questions about the presentation I gave earlier, which is um, kind of about our services deployment. So uh, if, you ha if you have any questions, feel free to put them into the chat or, um, or ask them here. But um, in, in lieu of questions there, what I really wanted to come and talk to you about it, just as a lightning talk is this thing called the 30 minute rule. Um, this is advice I share with anybody who kind of works in our industry or frankly, most industries where problem solving is a key skill. Um, and it's, it's this little blog post that I kind of ran across, I don't know, like in the last 12 months or something from this guy named Dan Greenfield, who, um, I got to spend some time with at a couple different times at some Django conferences over the years. And I actually kind of just went to look him up again. I was like, man, I wonder what Dan's doing these days. Um, and I found this site and this was like the top post at that point. So I read it anyways. Um, it's a 30 minute rule and it means that if you're stuck on something for more than 30 minutes, you should ask for help. It's a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and he outlines uh, what I think is a pretty convincing argument in favor of it. But um, I mostly wanted to say that prior to reading this, I think this matches my um, my belief about how to be effective in our in our area. Um, and I've believed this for a long time, and I think he kind of just put it to paper. Um, but basically, the idea is um, ask more or less anyone, uh, like coworkers and collaborators are kind of a, a, like maybe your first stop. Um, then maybe go start looking online, discussion groups and social media. I don't use social media, but um, Stack Overflow is kind of like a big community of places to ask for help. Um, and uh, I like this perspective because um, I think it's more effective. Like if, if effectiveness is measured by the time from when you experience the problem to when you solve it, I think you'll shorten that time by asking for help. I also believe it's more fun and I don't, I really don't want to discount the value of fun. Um, it's just more fun for me, not for everyone, everyone, everyone's different, but for me, it's just more fun to work with people. Um, so, uh, I like it. It also helps avoid frustration. I mean, like you can really quickly spend way more time than you expected to stuck on something. Um, so there's a link here, um, in the, in the chat, uh, or in the, the agenda to it, but you can look it up. It's, it's a research like Danny 30 minute or Danny Greenfeld 30 minute, and you'll find this blog post. And that's what I wanted to encourage you. Here's a picture of Danny. Here you go. Um, 30 minute rule. Yeah. I want to add to this. One of the things, um, that's helpful about asking for help is that it requires you to articulate the problem. And in that process of forming that question, a lot of times I find the answer. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and just sometimes it's just helpful to ask the question in order to be even find the answer yourself. So I think some people call that rubber ducking. Yep, that's exactly Stephen. <laughs> yep. Um, yep, so this is my pitch for a more collaborative, more fun, um, more effective uh, strategy for when you encounter a problem that you don't know how to solve and you've been working on it for at least 30 minutes. That's the talk. Nice. Now, Brian, do you want to take uh, questions, comments uh, from your services talk, given that we ran out of time at the end there? Uh, I mean, if there are any, sure. Um, I just wanted to point something out. I will drop, actually, you know what? I can just present really briefly. It's very much tied to the work that you all have done and it's been very exciting to me personally. Uh, okay, here we go. Let's see how this looks when the share comes up. I'll make this a little bigger. So um, this is a copper repo called Pulp Test. Uh, those of you who are familiar, this is the, 
place where you can hand a source tar gzip to copper and it will build a repository with your rpms in it a lot of people use it uh, brian noted that we were using their entire uh, repo as a large data uh, example we've been working in the pulp rpm team we've been working with copper uh, they are exploring the possibility of using pulp as their back end and this which is a publicly available copper repo as you can see is the first ever copper project with results in pulp. This is being stored in pulp and served from a pulp instance, specifically uh, in the midst of all the work that Brian was giving us a presentation on. Um, this has been very cool. Uh, and working with the copper team has been a delight. And uh, we have also been giving all kinds of stuff to the services mini team, uh, and they've been giving stuff to us to make this possible. So it's been a really good example of collaboration. And over the next, I don't know what Copper's timeline is, but the, the idea here is to very methodically load more and more into this, this pulp instance for Copper and take more and more of the, the back end load off of their existing kind of organic strapped together thing that they have built over the last the last several many years. So this is personally exciting to me and it factors into the talk that Brian gave because this is an example of uh, something people can see that is taking advantage of all that work that the services team has done. And uh, we bless him for it. Thanks for sharing this. Um, this is definitely an example of a like 18 month collaboration mm -hmm. between not just the services team. This all started with just the pulp team and helping copper you know evaluate pulp as a solution for their storage backend and making lots of performance improvements along the way to make it a, <clears throat> a solution that can handle all this data and it's really nice being able to show this first repository that they've uh, published into pulp the hosted service yeah yeah yeah, we we learned. I mean, there there've been a, a few features that Copper needed for the workflow to make sense, and so we've we've added a few, and we've got a couple more before we've actually filled all of the the of the things that they need for what they they do. Um, but certainly, there's a difference between I'm running Pulp with 100 repos, and a repo has 500 RPMs in it, and it all works pretty well, and then you load all of Copper into it, all as Brian said, 170,000 plus repositories. Also, one repository with 280,000 RPMs in it, that taught us many things from a performance standpoint. So it's been great to have this as a real world example. It's one of the things that I love as an engineer on a, on a backend project is you don't really know where your knee, your performance knees are until you get real people doing real things with the, uh, with the product. Um, and Copper has taught us a ton. Uh, and, and all of you on this call are benefiting from this work because everything is getting faster and, and tighter. It's been great. Steve? Go ahead, Steven. Yeah, uh, just out of curiosity, do you happen to have a link to the Copper source code? Like if I was interested in standing of my own instance with backed by pulp where would i look um okay. you mean code that talks to pulp well so, so the, the the copper application uh i assume is open source i mean it may not yeah, be it is yeah, yeah what i know about is where the code that talks to pulp lives and i think you could start from there <laughs> um okay and I'll I'll put a link here in the chat in a second. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you. Outstanding. There we go. Nice catch, Brian. Yeah. So this is an interesting question on chat um, about the importance of adding domains. Um, how hard is it to add domains to pull Deb? Um, the person who's added more domain support than anyone that I know is Jared. And Jared, I wonder if you could field this question. Is that all right? Uh, 
I suspect Jared's finding the mute button. Yes. Found the mute button. Okay. Boom. Um, adding domain support is mostly about the complexity of the plugin and mainly how many additional APIs or extra features they offer that is like outside the norm of the, the, the given pulp core API. And so for something like pulp file, which is our simplest plugin, it's really easy. We have one content type. Um, it basically follows all the, the features of pulp core. And so you got a lot of it for free. There's very little, little work. For something like pulp Python, which introduced a couple of new APIs to support PyPI APIs. It's a bit more complex, but it still only had one content type. So it was fairly simple. Uh, for something like RPM, there were no new APIs. And so that was a bonus, but it does have a lot of different content types and a lot of different tasks. And so that took a while. You have to go through each one and make sure that you're covering every spot. And from my current understanding of what Pulp Dev is, is that it's almost similar to Pulp RPM in terms of complexity, maybe a little bit less complicated. And so it probably wouldn't be too hard. Um, but yeah, that's my current understanding. Yeah, so here, uh, thanks, thanks a bunch, Jared. Um, here's a link also to, I went and found the pulp gem one. So uh, I completely agree with Jared's point, which is that it varies based on the complexity of the plugin. So here's an example of what I think is mostly a basic plugin. I didn't do this conversion, but um, it's not the most basic, but it's maybe just one bump above that. Um, so you can kind of get an idea for what what was he, what what was done for pulp gem as an example, and then the, the other observation I'll make is um, again having never converted something to domains myself, is um, the domain and the role based access control tend to always go together. You and I actually forget why, um, but as my understanding is, you can't add one without the other, um, and so. Uh, Anyone or and or Jared, can you level set me on my claim here? Mm. It's sort of true, but sort of not true. Uh, the main thing is that when we add domains, we're basically adding another level for the RBAC system to work on. And so now it's no longer just model level or object level. It's now model level which is now you can think of as global, then domain level, and then object level. And so if you don't have the RBAC access policies in place, you're basically losing out on this, um, this new level, even if you implement domains in, within your, um, your plugin. So you could technically do it without RBAC, but you're losing a lot of benefit of domains. Yeah, the main benefit that you get with, if you, if the plugin doesn't have RBAC and it just has domains enabled, it gets the benefit of separating content and artifacts between domains. So each domain will store um, its own artifacts, even if they're the same as artifacts in another domain, they're going to be stored separately in each domain. And that's the benefit you would get if you didn't have any RBAC in the plugin. Also, that community PR you linked, um, I need to look at it again, because I did do, review that uh, PR earlier this year. I have not taken a look again. But that would be a, yeah, a good first step, is to get that one merged. And then after that, um, you can easily add 
domains afterwards. Very cool. All right, anybody have any uh, questions for, other questions for Brian on the services deployment that we have? And if not, does anybody have an idea for a lightning talk that they would like to give? We have a little bit of time here and I'm just perfectly happy to have this just be open Q&A as well. So, Bruno, are you willing to give that talk off the top of your head? Yeah, I can do that. Like, it's not something that's completely uh, ready yet, but as we are working on it, and we'll certainly affect Pope next year. Okay. Maybe I can give a brief about it. Sure. What do you think? Okay. I'm good. Let me see. Especially give a uh, give like a, a 15 second why Dynaconf matters to pulp because a lot of people may not be aware and then go for it. Okay, so my name is Bruno. I work for uh, Ansible Galaxy uh, as a backend developer and also I am the creator and maintainer of Dynaconf. Uh, Pedro, which also works for pulp, is the second uh, maintainer for Dynaconf. So we both maintain the the project, uh, the library has like, com is completing 10 years of, of life and is being used by Pulp 3, I think since the beginning of Pulp 3. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so inside the Red Hat, it's used by uh, uh, other projects, like mostly of all Ansible components right now. And yeah, so Dynaconf is the library that uh, manages all the Pope settings. So it's, it replaces the Django uh, original settings with a, a new instance of Dynaconf. And this instance can uh, read settings from multiple sources like different file formats or, or places. And also gather, um, it, it, for Pope it's important because it gathers settings from multiple plugins and brings into a single settings object that all the plugins can uh, access in the same way, and also allows to override the settings via environment variables. Uh, yeah, I think that's the way Pop uses it uh, via environment variables mainly, but it can be like for any external source like Redis, vaults, and, and things like that. Well, so Dynaconf has 10 years of life. And right now it's on the three to six version and it works uh, without like huge problems, despite the some bugs that we are currently working on to fix. Uh, but the problem is aging. So with any project, we have this, this problem. And when Dynaconf was first designed, there were no type annotations in Python. Uh, it existed, uh, the proposals, like it, at that point, Type annotations was type hints that could be done via comments. Uh, but now like Python itself modernized and we have uh, different ways to uh, express uh, data. So let me give like a brief difference on what's coming on, on Dynacon 4. So right now Dynacon works this way uh, that I have here on my, on my screen. So you create an instance of Dynacon in your Python project. Pope does this inside the settings.py for the Pope core application. And then you feed it with uh, arguments. So you pass like parameters here and a list of validators uh, that are a sequence of conditions that the settings should met. So for example, in this case, name is required and port should be greater than 80. So uh, this works, but it's not modern Python because we are moving almost everything to be type annotated. So default for uh, Dynacon 4 is that this is still going to be uh, uh, allowed, 
because we don't like to break compatibility. Uh, that's my personal take on, on software. Like I don't like to break compatibility. So I prefer to build software on having layers of, of compatibility and feature flagging. So the current way of managing settings will keep working without any, uh, any problems. Uh, but on 4.0, we are going to add type annotations. So the new way will be like, you're gonna be creating your new uh, settings class. And instead of using Dynaconf, it's gonna be using Dynaconf.typed, which is this new module. We are working inside the same Dynaconf module in a way that we can have both words living together. And then instead of just uh, creating your instance, you're gonna be subclassing Dynaconf and describing your settings this way. So this is the way that Python is doing. And it, it, it's, uh, if you look for like Pydentic settings or Hydra settings or any other settings library, everyone move it to uh, something like this. And we have the opportunity to use the now stable Python annotated uh, typing to express any kind of uh, data conf key value validation we want. So in this example, I need the settings, let's say settings for Django or for Pope to have a name key uh, and should be a string and it's required. Uh, but I can have, for example, a port that is annotated and should be an integer and should be, for example, equal uh, 88. So it's more expressive uh, way to, to provide this, those things. And also I can have like a host name that is in the same way annotated a string and should be a URL. So some built-in common validators for uh, database connection strings and things like that will be provided uh, built into the library. Uh, right now, those are things that users sh should be creating themselves, like Pop has some on the settings spy file, uh, but Dynaconf will come with the most common one. So with this example, you can have your uh, settings created. I hope it works because I'm working a non-stable branch, but as soon as I run this code, I should have validation errors. Uh, let's see why I have this message here. Invalid syntax because I'm missing something. No, that's right. So here it is. So I have a validation error saying that name is required, port is required, and host name is required. So you see, uh, I didn't have to provide any Dynaconf validator. I just provided uh, Python type annotations and Dynaconf translates it to uh, the validators. So this name is required because I don't have a default value. If I put a default value here saying name equals Bruno, then uh, name stops being required. Now just port and host name is required because name now has a default. I could be taking from, from there. And, and that's it. So the idea is to simplify the way we express a settings by a schema and use Python annotated uh, typing to express everything like validators, merging strategies, filters, trans, uh, transformers. So uh, we are building uh, this new uh, API right now, like me and Pedro, we are working a bit on it. So. It's a chance for anyone who wants to contribute or give suggestions on how it would work better. Uh, but the best part is that like now we can do things like this. So let's say here I have these two variables that are for a uh, host. So why not create a host type? So we have this data dict right now. So I can move this information here to this type and I can say that my settings now has like a host that is of type host. So this kind of thing I think is, is amazing because it's more expressive. You're gonna see the error is the same because it's still validating, uh, but the, uh, the, the way to express the validators are, I think, uh, more ergonomic and another uh, thing that is valid, I don't have it here because my current code editor doesn't have uh, autocomplete, but if you are on PyCharm or VS Code or anything, when you hit dot here, you're gonna have the complete for names and, and, and types, which is something we don't have currently. So yeah, basically that's the main change we are doing in Dynacom 4. Uh, I hope in the beginning of 
2025, we're going to have the first release. Uh, if you install it from the master branch, you can already use it uh, to play around. Yeah. And that's all. That's my lightning talk. Thanks. Awesome. Outstanding. Job, Outstanding. Excited to get access to that. Is there a required Python version for this new upgrade? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, Python 3.9. So I'm trying to make it available uh, in 3.9 putting some compatibility layer. So for example, we can have annotated type and other things with Python 3.9. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? OK. Do we have any other proposals for quick talks that people might want to hear about today? Give folk a moment to think about that. Going once, going twice. All right, I'm gonna end the recording on our lightning talk session here. Hang on a moment.